Man is a social being. In fact, he was created that way by God. Genesis 2 verse 18, when God created man, he knew that it was not good for man to be alone. He knew that man needed companionship. Man needs friendship. In fact, Solomon points this out in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning with verse number 9, when he says that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him so. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. This section of Scripture scripture teaches us the importance of companionship and friendship. We recognize the best friend that man can have is God. God as our friend has provided us with relationships that provide companionship, that provide friendship. When God instituted the marital relationship between one man and one woman, that's designed for companionship as well as friendship. The church as the family of God, you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ, the church is a, is a family and thus constitutes friendship among brethren. As Christians, our, some of our best friends, our best friends ought to be our own brethren in Christ Jesus. But even more so, the brotherhood of man in general that we talked about last Sunday evening, how we all constitute one race, the human race. The brotherhood of man in general also provides opportunities for friendship. However, we must recognize as well that there are dangers, there are pitfalls in friendship. It is possible to have the wrong kinds of friends. And so we must recognize that these kind of friends, the wrong kind, can bring great harm to us, physically, but above all, spiritually. We turn our attention now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and and look at verse number 33. The King James Version reads, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good morals. But the ASV, the American Standard Version, is the more correct rendering. When it it renders this verse, be not deceived, evil companionships corrupt good morals. When you think about the context of this verse as it relates to the Corinthian situation, verse 32 connects into verse 33. And we made mention of this last Sunday morning. If there is no resurrection as some at Corinth had held to and as they were teaching others to believe, then the mindset should be just to follow the way of the world. The the rest of how the city of Corinth was living then, just eat, drink, live it up, for tomorrow we die. Paul here is quoting from Isaiah chapter 22 and and verse number 13 to make a point. And his point is, for, for the sake of the argument he has just introduced, he is referencing the light-hearted attitude of Israel and Judah when foreign invaders entered the land, entered their homeland, and in particular entered the city of Jerusalem, and began to devastate it. He points out that instead of turning to God, they indulged in revelry. Instead of mourning for sin, they purposefully turned further from God in uttering this proverb, let's just go ahead and eat and drink, for tomorrow we're simply going to die. The point is, if there was no resurrection, as some taught at Corinth, and as some were being led to believe, then you might as well just live it up. For death is the end. Now note verse 33. From from this verse, Paul tells them, he warns them, be not deceived. And so he refutes the rightness of living by the code of sinners philosophy, which some at Corinth had come to believe. For to live by such a standard and to be influenced by others to live thusly is to be deceived. 
Now, this isn't the only time the Corinthians were warned against such. You, you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9, when you find a warning given to them not to return to the immoral practices they had been once engaged in. And certainly this is a repudiation of the do- certainly a repudiation of the doctrine of the resurrection would permit such a lifestyle. And it certainly appears those who taught this doctrine whom the Corinthians associated with were influencing them towards such behavior once again. So Paul is warning against such individuals who would lead them away from Christ in their hope that is found only in Christ through the gospel. Now you think about an application for us today as Christians. Our friends, if we are not careful. Now, this applies both to our youth and even to us as older individuals. Our friends can lead us away from Christ in that same hope. You see, the hope we have in Christ Jesus, the hope of eternal life, is tied to the way we live. We understand that. Associating with flat-out evil people, and again, those who engage in, in immoral behavior, outright immoral behavior, whose sole pursuit is immorality, well, they can destroy our standing with God and cause us to lose our reward and our soul. Thus, it is essential we choose that we make and that we keep the right kind of friends. This morning, as we think about morality and immorality, And as we think about the friendships we have, as we think about the right kind of friends and the wrong kind, and as we think about the influence you and I have on others, our friends, and that they can have on us for either good or bad, we need to be careful. We need to watch our friends, as it were. And we're going to examine this warning that Paul gave the Corinthians here in verse 33 of chapter 15 regarding the influence of those who were teaching falsely regarding the resurrection that influence they were having on the church there in application to our friendships. In this lesson, we're going to look at this admonition to be not deceived. Then we're going to notice the declaration of the corrupting influence that the wrong kind of friends can have on us. We're going to make the realization that that if we run with the wrong crowd as Christians, ultimately we're going to become friends of the world once again and make ourselves enemies of God. Finally, we're going to examine some biblical principles which will enable us to choose the right friends and those who will help us and not hinder and hurt us spiritually. I want us to show that not only do we wield influence for either good or evil with others, but so too do others wield that same influence on us. To, they can influence us to good or evil, to believing truth or lies, and thus we're going to show in the course of our study the importance of, of choosing our friends wisely. So with these thoughts in mind, first of all, notice with me the admonition that Paul gives regarding our friends. And he tells them, he tells the Corinthians, and he tells us to be not deceived. And again, this phrase, be not deceived, is used four times total in the New Testament. And every time it's used, it involves a warning with serious consequences involved. Now, very briefly, we consider these passages. Luke 21, verse 8. We have a warning not to be deceived, given by Christ here by false prophets, proclaiming who would proclaim to be the Christ. Christ is telling his disciples, you don't be deceived. You don't allow them to to deceive you and cause you to be destroyed when the city of Jerusalem is is destroyed. Don't allow them to, to lead you astray. Then you go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 where Paul tells the churches of Galatia to be not deceived. God is not mocked. So there we have this warning given. Don't be led astray by thinking you can sow whatever you want to and be pleasing to God. The The reality is, he is saying, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The inviolable law of sowing and reaping. If you sow to the Spirit, of the Spirit you're going to reap life everlasting. If you sow to the flesh, of the flesh you're going to reap eternal condemnation. Verse number 8. Then you go back to chapter 6 and verse 9 of 1 Corinthians, of the book of 1 Corinthians. As we've already alluded to, Paul warns the Corinthians not to live a life of licentiousness, not to go back to the old manner of life. 
Such a life will not allow one to inherit the kingdom. But then we come here to verse 33 of chapter 15, our lesson text. Again, we have this warning not to be enticed by evil companions or associations. Now, what does it mean to be deceived? Well, simply put, it's to cause to stray, to lead astray, to lead aside from the right way, to lead into error, to deceive, to be led aside from the path of virtue, to go astray or to sin. And such evil corrupting influence can cause us as Christians to go astray, to turn aside from God. And so Paul is warning us, don't be deceived. Don't allow yourself to be led astray. Now what does he want us to know? Well, here's the declaration regarding the wrong kinds of friends. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Perhaps the greatest example in all the scripture given of this principle of those who were corrupted by evil companions, is that of Solomon. Solomon perhaps best exemplifies what Paul is talking about here. Turn with me to 1 Kings, excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And let's look at what Solomon did. Look at the wicked influence his wives and concubines had on him. And remember, this was a man of great wisdom. Remember at the outset of his reign, he prayed to God. God said, you pray to me, I'll give you what you desire. And he could have prayed for riches, but instead he prayed for wisdom. And we understand God was so pleased by his request that not only did God grant him the wisdom to rule, but he also granted him great wealth. Now we see a man not so wise. He did not use his wisdom properly. Notice here, verse verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, all very idolatrous nations, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, and again, God had warned about this, He said, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. God gave the warning. Look what happens. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Look what these women did. His wives turned away his heart. Now, can this apply to men too? Absolutely. Absolutely. We understand that principle, but here we're looking at the choices that Solomon made. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Well, how did this happen? Again, by their wicked influence. And his heart was not perfect, that is, complete with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. And as a result, he started building high places in the land of Israel. Again, you look at Solomon. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Solomon started out his reign as king serving God and look what happens. Because of the companions, the friends his associations. Their influence turned him away from God, turned him to idolatry. You think about the book of Proverbs. It illustrates this principle we are noting here in 1 Corinthians 15. And ironically, Solomon wrote much of this book. And again, it's ironic in the sense as well, Solomon gives this sage advice, but he fails to heed his own advice. In Proverbs 1, verse 10, the Proverbs writer says to the young man, If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Don't choose those, he is saying, as associates, if their goal is to get you to do things you know you ought not to be doing. And this is especially true for our young people as they grow up, and especially as they reach high school age. The older you get, the the more the more your friends are going to want to entice you to do certain things because they say it'll make you cool. 
You need to do this with us. You need to go with us because you could be cool like we are. Well, being cool doesn't make it godly. Trying to be cool can make you turn out to be a fool if you're not careful. Further, the Proverbs writer says in verses 16 and 18, is to don't make friends with those whose purpose is to pursue evil. Notice the phrase, whose feet run to evil. That is, they have their mindset, their goal, their focus on sinful pursuits. Don't, allow, don't make friends with these. Don't allow them to corrupt you into following such a lifestyle. Then you look at Proverbs chapter 2. And you look at what is noted in verse 11. When, the, when, when, when Solomon writes, Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. That is the importance of listening to God. Listening to His Word. Listening to wisdom. What can it do? It will deliver thee from the way of the evil man. From the man that speaketh forward or perverse things. And it will deliver thee from the strange woman, verse 16, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. In other words, we need to avoid those who rebel and have no respect for authority, especially divine authority. And, we need, and those who put the focus of life solely on the pleasures of the flesh. Who have the eat, drink, and be merry mentality that Paul warned against in verse 32. But then you look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 12 through 14 as well, and we see another sobering warning where it talks about how the wicked devise of their, their many avenues of mischief. Where, where the Proverbs writer says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a forward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Forwardness or perverseness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. That is, we need to avoid those who would use us as tools for their wickedness. That is, there are those who, don't, who really don't want to be our friends, but rather want to use us in order to accomplish their wicked purposes. They are, as it were, fair weather friends wanting to use us and abuse us to fulfill their selfish desires. So this is what the Bible has to say very briefly about the wrong kind of friends. They can corrupt us. Now, what happens if we run with the wrong crowd? Well, James 4 verse 4 tells us that that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. When we allow ourselves to be enticed by the wicked, when they, allow, when they influence us to do wickedness, we become friends with the world. We are no longer living the transformed life. We are no longer being conformed to the image of Christ, but rather we are conforming our lives to the image of the world, which Paul warned against in Romans chapter 12, in verse number 2. And as a result, we're becoming the enemy of God, or one who is antagonistic toward God once again. And again, we have the command to be not conformed, but rather be transformed. And again, we understand the world here is used in reference to sinful conduct. Worldly behavior which is directly opposite of godliness. We understand we live in the world. We live in the world, but we are not to be of the world. That is, our conduct is not to be world-like. And that's why John warned, to love not the world, neither the things which are in the world. And, and what are those things? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those things are not of the Father, but of the world. And these things ultimately are going to fade away. They're going to be destroyed because they are sinful. And all sin will ultimately be cast into the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, Revelation 21, in verse number 8. Now what's the problem that you and I face? What's the problem that young people face in their everyday lives? Well, again, it's sinful influence 
which causes them to conform to the world, which causes us to conform to the world once more. And again, this is the point of verse Corinthians 15.33. Sinful, worldly influence, such as false doctrine in, this con- in the case of the Corinthians in that particular context, in world and immorality causes us to become conformed to the world once again. Now, what does it mean to become a friend of the world? What, what is this phrase? What are we talking about here? Well, in my study, I like how Albert Barnes in his commentary explains it. The friendship of the world is the love of the world, of the maxims which govern it. It's the principles which reign there, the ends that are sought, the amusements and gratifications which characterize it as distinguished from the church of God. It consists in setting our hearts on those things and conforming to them and making them the object of our pursuit with the same spirit which they are sought by those who make no pretensions to religion. It's the idea of of setting our affections on things on the earth rather than on those things which are above. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3. As Christians, we can't afford to set our affections on the things on the earth, lest we become like the world once again. The challenge is, is to keep our minds set on those things which are above, things, those things which are unseen and which are eternal. To keep our minds focused on heaven so that we can walk by faith and rather, rather than by sight. We need to be careful then whom we make friends with. Their influence can have a detrimental impact on us spiritually. I'll give you a case in point. A young man I grew up with was my best friend in, in growing up. We were only three months apart in age. In fact, his, he lived right down, just was almost my next door neighbor. We were very close. In fact, we obeyed the gospel right around the same time. Back in May of 1992, I obeyed during a weekend gospel meeting at my home congregation. I obeyed on a Saturday night. He obeyed a week, a week later. So we, we grew up in the church. We learned how to wait on the Lord's table together. We learned, to, we learned how to lead public prayers together grow, growing up. We, we were very close. We, 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 we enjoyed going to Bible ball together, studying the Bible together. But as we grew older, as we got into high school, and as we got on, as we grew into to young adults, we, we grew apart. We, we, our friendship grew apart. Eventually, he began running with some people he shouldn't have been running with. Fell away from the church completely. Got into tr- he got into trouble financially, and he's also been in trouble for, for robbery. And why, why did all of this happen to him? Because he began to run with the wrong crowd. He made friends with the wrong people. I use him as an example to show us that the, influ- their, the influence of our friends, our influence on them as well, can have a detrimental impact if we're not careful. A negative influence indeed, as we've stressed before, we stress time and again, is a corrupting influence. It can and often does turn us away from God. And as such, makes us hostile to God. And antagonistic to to, to Him. There are things we need to remember as Christians. Again, you go back to Proverbs 1 verse 10. If sinners entice us, we must not consent to their enticements. You know, verse number 15 of that same chapter, we cannot afford to walk with them in their, in their paths of ungodliness. We must refrain our feet from their path of ungodliness, that is, from following in their same actions. Proverbs 12, verse 26 in the New King James Version, and a lot of ver- translations differ on this, but I like how the New King James renders it. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. 
Watch you, friends, carefully. The wicked, the ungodly, the immoral can lead us away from God and lead us into a devil's hell. Now, what are some biblical principles which will, which will help us in choosing and maintaining the right kind of friendships? Well, number one, we need to accept God's guidance in every situation in life. 2 Peter 1, verse 3, God hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through His Word. It instructs us in righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 16. We need to listen to God. Proverbs 1, verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But it is fools who despise wisdom and instruction. We don't need to be foolish and despise the wisdom and the instruction that God offers to us through His blessed Word. We need to accept His guidance. And we need to turn to God in every situation in life, especially as it relates to our companions, our associations. We need to make God's wisdom one's first, our first and our closest companion. Notice what Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 7, beginning with verse number 4, when he says, Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth her, which flattereth with her words. We must be willing to receive the instruction of wisdom in order to gain wisdom. Chapter 1 and verse number 3 teaches us that. The purpose of these Proverbs, the purpose of God's Word, is to give subtlety or understanding to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. For in so doing, when we accept God's Word, when we turn to God's Word, when we accept His wisdom, we will know wisdom. We will know understanding and instruction and perceive the words of understanding, according to verse number 2. So we need to make God, His Word, and the wisdom we can glean from His Word our first and closest companion. But then we also need to recognize what constitutes a true and genuine friend. And there's, there's so many different principles we could consider but briefly consider four with me. Number one, a true friend is willing to rebuke us when necessary. That's why Susan, my, even though she's my wife, she's my best friend. She's not afraid to get on me when I need it. She's not afraid to rebuke me, to call me out when I do something that is not proper or wrong. And that's what a true friend does. Proverbs 28 verse 23 says, He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. And I've learned, and I'm thankful for all my brethren who have offered me rebuke throughout the years from time to time. A true friend who wants what is best for us will not always tell us what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. Proverbs 27 verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Paul asked the Galatians when he rebuked them for, for, their, being, for their willingness to put bear up with the Judaizing teachers. He asked them, Am I become your enemy now because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16 In reality, he wasn't the enemy. In reality, he was the best friend they had because he was warning them against the course that they were on if they continued on it by listening to those Judaizing teachers. But then number two, a true friend will never turn their back on you when times get tough. Proverbs 27 verse 10, the Proverbs writer says, Do not forsake your own friend. You see, this is what makes God man's greatest friend. That's why he's the Christian's greatest friend. He will never leave us nor forsake us. When earthly friends seem to forsake us, when clouds seem dark, when days seem long... God will be there for us. As Christians, it is so vital we emulate this characteristic with others. Further, Proverbs 17, 17 tells us, 
that a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Or we might put it thusly, a true friend is one who walks in when everyone else walks out. When the times get tough, these friends are there when the chips are down. Further, we true friends are those who strengthen our character, not weaken it. Just as evil companions corrupt good morals, good or righteous companions can strengthen good morals. Proverbs 27, in verse 17, iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. And as a result, they are going to influence us for good, not for evil. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Let your light so shine before men. What light? The light of Christ reflecting in our lives. That others may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in, which is in heaven. But will also be the salt, that preserving influence. That's what they can do for us. That's what we can do for them. No man is an island. We understand this. Pointed out in class, there's the old song. goes, I am a rock, I am an island. No man is an island, no man's a rock either. God did not create us, nor did He ever intend for us to go through life alone. Hence, God created us as social beings, as we observed in the outset. He wants us to have friends. However, as we have observed in this lesson, the wrong kind of friends can and often does bring dire consequences for us. But the right kind of friends can and will have positive consequences on our lives. Proverbs 13 and verse number 20 is a reminder to choose our friends, to choose our associates wisely. When the Proverbs writer states, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Why is that? Because they will lead us to our spiritual destruction. It's like we follow the wise. We'll be building our lives upon the rock. But if we follow fools, we'll be building our lives on the sand. And we understand what happens in that account as Christ depicted in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. May you and I, therefore, choose to surround ourselves with individuals who will help us get to heaven rather than those who will help, help us go to hell. We're going to one or two places, and as we talked about time and again, we can help one another. We can help one another go to heaven, but we can also help one another go to hell. Be not deceived. Evil companions corrupt good morals. We need to make the right kinds of friends. We need, if, if we're not a friend of Christ, we need to make friends with Christ. Remember, he said, told his disciples, ye are my friends if ye do what I say. In order to be Christ's friend, we must do what he says. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you're not a friend of God because you're directly opposed to him by living, a, by living in sin. But you can become the friend of God today by giving your life to him, having heard the word, believing it, Repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in the Christ as the Son of God, being buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins, you can become a child of God this morning, become the friend of God this morning, being added by the Lord to His church, the one body. However, as a Christian, if you've allowed sinful influences to sway you, to weaken your faith, pray to God. If you allowed sin to get the best of you, pray to God for forgiveness. He is faithful and just. Repent, though, first and confess your faults. Then pray. He is faithful and just to forgive. We can't afford to be led astray. Eternity is far too long to be led astray by others. We need to choose who our friends are wisely, and it begins by making God our friend. First and foremost, if you need to do that this morning, we encourage you to do that right now. If you need to be restored as a Christian, if you straight away, we encourage you to be restored once again. As together we stand, as we sing.